Yeah. All right. So, um, wow. Yeah, that's bright. Do we sit on the edge of the stage? A bit more, a bit more friendly. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. So, um, we're just going to do a little respect, uh, respect, a brief perspective on um, basically five. This is five years of DevOps. Um, it's probably been a bit longer than that now, isn't it? DevOps, 2009, I think. Patrick Dubois, yeah, yeah. Five years, give or take. Um, what do you guys think? Is everyone doing this now? Who, who got DevOps sealed up? No, guys, man, you're shaking your head. You go first. Like, I, we kind of live in a bubble where, like, yeah, we know all the folks that are doing DevOps, and, like, it's kind of self selected. Like, if you're interested in DevOps, you're going to come say hello to the people who are doing the DevOps, and that's kind of who we end up meeting. And, you know, unfortunately, what, long tail is long, right? So, like, there's lots of folks out there that are just sniffing around with Agile. They're like, what's this Agile thing? I don't, I don't really know. We're doing waterfall over here. That's awesome. And folks that are just looking at the cloud and just trying to figure out what this whole IT modernization thing even means. And, like, they need our help, too. You know, we love them, too. They have money, right? It's all good. Yeah, I agree completely. It's people today came up and said this is the first time we've heard of DevOps. I've uh, had the answer today. Yes, yeah, so I think that says it all. And we go into organizations, and even though they think they're doing DevOps, they really aren't. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's a long journey, and everyone's at a different stage. Do you think it's a certain type of organization who are the laggards in this? Banks? Insurance companies? I probably shouldn't. Okay, that's a rubbish question. Um, by the way, if anyone's got an answer, a question from the floor, just um, put your hand up and I'll come and find you with the microphone. Um, so, um, my perspective on the whole DevOps thing is a couple of years ago it just went all a bit crazy and everything was getting labeled DevOps. Um, and frankly, it was hell. You had a conversation about DevOps with somebody and a conversation with somebody else. The next day, it was just completely different. In terms of reference, were different. Um, and then the handbook came out. And I, I think that changed things. I think that's kind of focused people down on it. Does anyone have an opinion on that? No. I have uh, kind of an insight too about this. I actually run the LinkedIn DevOps group. And we've got 57,000 people. And one of the things that I'm finding is finally that discussion of what is DevOps is starting to go down. I mean, every week I was getting a new article saying, you know, I'm defining what DevOps is. I mean, how many definitions do we need? Right? So I think that that is starting to die down, but the core question is still the same. Because people who are coming to us and saying, what is DevOps? That means that it's not clear enough. I think it's very confusing when different people say DevOps, me and Matt we talked about earlier, they can mean very different things. Yeah, I'm from a very technical background and very much you know, tools and products, and other people come from a complete culture angle. And depending on your, who you talk to, they can you know, be talking, although they're talking DevOps, it can be completely different ways of working or technologies or, you know, it's, yeah, it's a, a type of term that's perhaps become too widely apportioned. Yeah, and you know what? I'm going to stop this conversation right now because we, we've all wanted to what is DevOps territory. I'm really, really sorry. I do apologise. Um, so what's coming up next on the, on the radar? Does anyone have any? I, I think um, there's a whole load of stuff that's happening technologically. Containers, serverless, all this sort of stuff. Um, do you guys see anything? Sorry, guys and girls, see anything happening? In terms of the way that people are re-implementing processes and, and, and the people stuff, is that changing at all, or is that kind of a solved problem? Again, from the perspective of running all day DevOps with 18,000 people responding, there's two things that we're looking at. The biggest thing that people want to hear about right now is the cultural transformation that has to happen in order to integrate DevOps into your culture at work. And the second thing is what Mandy and I were talking about right before we came up here is security, the automation of security within that pipeline has to happen right now. With the stuff that's been happening over the last month, it's crazy, it's just nuts. And so you cannot handle that manually. You have to automate the security process. 
Yeah, and I was also like, I'm gonna put my MBA hat on here for a minute. So one of my deepest, darkest secrets I will share with you is I have an MBA in global business. And like, the coming from a, if you don't understand my accent, I'm from the United States, right? So from a very US-centric standpoint, like the cultural components of this are really driven out of, were really driven initially out of our context. Like that was something that people were like, oh yeah, we don't like command and control. We don't want your top-down BS. Like we don't want your hierarchical organizations. And um, so that, sort of perspective doesn't fly everywhere. People aren't comfortable with it. And even in the United States, there's still a lot of organizations that really aren't into that. There's a lot of places that were built off sort of this militaristic hierarchical thing that was originally from like GM and GE in the, in the olden days, you know, back in the day. And that stuff still really plays everywhere. So while we feel like we've made a lot of progress and we certainly have in a lot of industries, <clears throat> There's a lot of places still that are reluctant, hesitant, scared, not feeling safe and supported enough to really make those changes because their context doesn't really allow for it. And um, it makes things super, super interesting for us when we go and talk to them because they're like, well, you know, our individual contributors don't really talk back to the boss when the boss says a thing. And this DevOps thing's really scary for us on that side. So just sell us a tool in a box and we'll be fine. So. I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I get told off when I say DevOps in a box. I know it winds people up. Um, I think, you know, what Matt said about technology and um, you know, I keep you know, having a lot of this abstraction and we're coming more and more abstracted away from the underlying traditional operations role. Um, and I think that changes if we look from the te te technical side of things, what we sort of look at DevOps as being. Okay. It's legacy applications, are we going to move these forward or we leave them as they are? Okay, but as we see more and more greenfield deployments, using technologies such as serverless. I see containers quite often as more of a transition technology. For certain workloads, they're good long term, but a lot it's just a, a quick way to get a legacy workload. You know, we could be more dynamic and agile you know, with it. Um, but the, as we become more and more abstracted, you know, is that going to change? You know, if we, I think the culture side of things is going to be very similar, but is the role of operations um, when we talk about DevOps and developers and operations working together, is that going to see significant change in the future? So, um, so the technology is always changing, isn't it? Um, I think we're, we're kind of getting used to that. Um, and I'm wondering if this whole movement is just about kind of an acceptance of change as a constant. Um, is it that you know, the technology changes, but the ways that you implement it maybe don't necessarily? And once you've made that organizational change, um, you, you're kind of on, on, on the route to, um, um, to, to doing, you know, doing things in a DevOps way. Um, does that resonate with anyone else? Thank you. Honestly, when you, when you look at it, and I would like you guys to get back on this too, the tool set doesn't matter. There's certain genres of tools, and you choose your tool, and you put it in your pipeline. And there's always going to be multiple choices within that pipeline. But in general, it's not the tools that are going to make the difference. It's the automation and it's the people that are going to make the difference. So, I agree with that one part, but I think, especially you know, the field that I work in, you know, I see people this is, yeah, adopting public cloud and platforms of service operate. And then actually, the tooling is very different, and the skill set, the type of people that if service technologies, we have like functions of Lambda, um, we have platform service offerings, and the way people interact and the tooling, it's a lot, a lot of operations, you know, staff are still, and will do for a long time, in the server mindset. You know, these are my servers, you know, even though they're now managing this capital out of pets, when you move to platform as a service, I think it's the tooling does change because it's the cloud provider that starts to control a lot of that. You know, whether it controls the right word or not, provide a lot of that tooling, and the people that work with that need different skill sets. So just throwing that out there. 
Yeah, um, we started thinking about that too. Like, what what happens to Chef when like servers go away? Right. Like, what's next? Like, how you how you work in that context and what that actually ends up looking like. And like, part of our focus is like recognizing why we were caring about infrastructure in the first place. And it's not that I'm awesome at running thousands of Linux boxes, even though I totally am. Like, it's about what actually lives on those machines that provides value and, and does business for my company. And turning that sort of on its ear to be sort of application-minded versus infrastructure-minded on the operations side changes, like you said, changes a lot of the tooling that you use and changes the things that you are collecting metrics for, changes your telemetry, changes a lot of this other stuff in your ecosystem. And the skill sets are similar, right? And this sort of falls out of like the SRE versus DevOps conversation where what your focus, what your goal is with your applications is the site stays up and it makes you money and all those things and whether that includes caring about where a file is on a virtual system versus how a container is running really shouldn't matter. We all get to that. Sorry, call me napping. Excellent, thank you. A uh, question here from Sean. Yeah. Do you think, sorry. Do you think with the rise of people sort of selling enterprise DevOps and people saying, you know, here are DevOps best practices and here's how we think you should be doing DevOps. And are we potentially going down the route of, you know, there being sort of a bad DevOps? coming up here, uh, people telling enterprises and big organizations what they think they want to hear or what they want to hear about DevOps and what it is, rather than actually telling them what they need to hear. Yeah, I love this question. Like, we get this a lot. And like, previous, I call it the agile industrial complex, right? So like, during the agile, early days of the agile movement, you started to see this sort of initial sort of militarization of how you do agile. Like, you go and you get your Scrum certification, and you go and you learn all of these things, and there's very much a prescribed step-by-step -step sort of thing that people loved about that. Like, it made it really approachable for people who are like, I don't know what I'm doing with this, so just tell me what to do. And pe people on our side, on the vendor side of the conversation, are willing to sort of publish that best practice and that sort of pushing out those ideas because there's a thirst for it in the marketplace. And it's it's a comfort level, it's a I don't want to screw this up sort of thing because being comfortable with failure and with experimentation, while it's part of being DevOps and being lean and all these other buzzwords that we're pushing around, it's not part of reality yet for a lot of places. And that's totally understandable. We don't necessarily want your bank to be super cavalier about what they're doing. But at the same time, like pushing all that stuff back in, like, it, it's hard to meet them halfway. It's hard to say, well, here's a good suggestion, because they hate that answer. I give that answer a lot, people are like, fuck you. Like, just tell me what to do. They want DevOps in the box. Okay, Dave. Apologies, Marcus may have a bit of an advanced idea on this. So, I have a problem with all of this. Um, I've witnessed many companies going, DevOps was great, but oh, at the beginning it was really, really hard. So, panel, over the next two years, what's going to make it more easy? Buy more stuff from us. <laughs> Obviously, my point of view, technology, but on the other than technology, because yeah, technology is changing so rapidly. Yeah. Uh, the deployments are becoming well, not easier, but we're getting a lot more control of what we do with our software um, for less overhead. But I think also the skill sets are going to start to catch up with what I would hope we're going to start to catch up with what's required in the industry. We know there's massive skill, skills gaps. People who know what they do with DevOps. You know, um, 
and hopefully in time either they become less of those roles and I think that's a big possibility because you'll be able to do more with less because the technology will assist you to do more with less. Um, if not, people are going to have to find those skills from somewhere to accelerate and help change things. Does that sort of help? I think one of the things that I would like people to understand is this is a still a nascent process that we're going through. That when people say there are best practices, at this stage I think there's common practices. I don't think there's best practices yet. It's too soon. So we're looking for the common practices that are starting to work across multiple industries, across uh, multiple enterprises, and then we can start building on that. Someone cutting grass. Okay, last question from Dave Bissell. Um, Dave Bissell. Is there a convergence like to happen with the Internet of Things over the next couple of years? Uh, yeah, so we've done a couple of IoT projects with some of our, our uh, customers, but on the platform side, right? So managing their platform. IoT is going to be tough um, for, I think, DevOps to sort of look at from the perspective of the devices and the things that sort of live in the, the IoT components, like the struggles that we end up having there is, are they secured from the baseline? Are they, are they gonna work when we put them out in the field and the person at the other end is a mechanic or a truck driver or my grandmother's neighbor's dog or whoever has you know this thing? And um, making sure those are all uh, safe, secure, not recording random things like what's mine? We don't know. Um, or my toaster isn't doing something weird. And I think the hard part that we've seen on that side is um, dealing with life cycle with the IoT and sort of. And mobile has done this. Like mobile went through all of this years ago, where you're doing your local development, and then how often do you push out? the new iOS, how often you push out the Android update, and how often you push those things out. We'll see the same things with IoT. And I don't know that DevOps itself really has a, a role outside of just supporting the build environments and the dev side. On the server side, yeah. yeah, cool. Anyone, any final thoughts on that? I was just going to say the principles stay the same, don't we? are trying to deliver value. You know, the principles stay the same, there's other challenges, such as, you know, these are what we connected devices, how we update them if things go wrong, but ultimately the principles are the same. What about blockchain? No, I'm only joking. So, I think we've covered um, DevOps principles, DevOps in the box, um, DevOps as a service, they'll solve all your IoT and blockchain and cloud needs. Any more buzzwords we need? No, I don't think so. Cool, we're about out of time, so let's have a big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you.
know that with this pair, I can give these to my application engineers, I can give them to my operations engineers. Anytime they want to make a change that's going to end up in production, they know they have to meet these requirements via this testing language and this, this sort of testing workflow. So there's how they work together. You can take a look at what's in the OS hardening cookbook. As I said, it's like system level stuff. Pretty basic as far as, as the things that it will do. We ran it, we saw our fixes from our failures. And then what the actual profile then ends up looking like, you can test a, a single resource for a lot of things. So you're testing a file, thinking about what I care about with that file. I care about who owns it. I care about the group that owns it. I care about the, um, the mod on it, you know, things like that. And you can test all of those things against every resource that you want. So over time, what we hope is that the security pieces become part of your life cycle. You want to make it easy so that when you get to production, your application says, well, I really needed this hole poked in the firewall on the, on the system. So you can say, well, you should have known. Like, we have that in the profile. It would have failed your tests early on, and you could have talked to us four months ago instead of when you were ready to deploy. So you can actually get in front of a lot of those issues. So you can build a comprehensive set of checks for everything that you've got. Run them every time someone makes a change. They can run them locally as they're doing their local development. You can plug it into your workflow, into your build servers, and then hopefully make it easier and easier for people uh, to use them all the time. So some resources. Inspect lives at inspect.io. Kitchen lives at kitchen.io. Um, we have a bunch of training and workshops on, on our uh, GitHub repository. There's a whole lot of stuff on Inspect. A uh, woman by the name of Annie Hedgepeth used Inspect as a vehicle to get her back into the workforce after being off, like raising little kids, right? And um, she now works for one of our partners in Chicago, but it's a super interesting, like 11 part blog about working with Inspect and digs into some of the things I talked about. Um, you can also join our Slack, and if you're interested in the sample, my code is up as well. Finally, I'll push our summit. We're here next week uh, at Fenchurch Street, talking to the rest of our community. We'll have a couple of folks that have been using Inspect for a while, and I'm um, talking about like their journey towards being more secure and more conscious of how their security compliance affects their workflow and their speed of agility and all that stuff. So, thanks. Good stuff, excellent, thank you very much, Mandy. Okay, so does anybody have a question for Mandy? Rory, I knew I could rely on you. Uh, so I realize that with uh, SSH, this might be academic since most people use the SSH out of the box, but for other things like web servers, Apache's quite often ran from source or from a different than the OS package. How, how does it, its protocol I just find out what the protocol is and how will it account for Oh, so for some of the built-in resources, it, there's um, for Apache, for Nginx, for a number of other ones, there's actually a parsing class built into the inspect package. So it has the things that it knows about in those files. So if you have something that you've really deviated from sort of the norm, you might have to, to go and either patch that class or make a, a custom resource to deal with that, those changes that you've made. It's all Ruby under the hood, so there's a lot of inheritance you can have for the parsers to sort of build your own and it'll figure everything out for you. I just figured that could break the whole security thing. What's that? I just figured that could break the whole security thing because if I give somebody a security spec, well, it turns out that person has used third party things. Yeah, like one of the things that we've run into, uh, we saw with a lot of our customers is that every team sort of had their own thing that they were doing or they had their own deployment for different components and this ended up being a really nice tool for them to. That's what? Uh, thank you. Um, could we use this to bin off Tripwire and get rid of our Tripwire license cost? I would love to tell you that yes. However, it depends on what you're doing with Tripwire. Like, you can see from the way some of these things are defined in the, in the inspect profiles is that you have to be very explicit at the things you want to test. 
So if you're using Tripwire in a limited way and not doing like a universal system catalog, like you can start to sort of port that yeah, stuff over to something like Inspect in a, in a more efficient manner. If you're doing just sort of a blast grab the entire system with your IDS, then it translate, translates less. Like it's like it would be a lot more work to probably get things to really yeah. I mean, we have a, a PCI environment, so we've got Cat 1, Cat 2, Cat 3. Yeah. We're just getting the idea of different profiles based on different categories. Yeah, you can definitely get that far. Okay, right, that's a bit noisy. Any more questions for Mandy? Yes, okay. Um, Mandy Walsh, thank you very much. Thank you.